Well, good morning and welcome to St. Paul United Methodist Church. Uh, my name is Pastor Clifton, and it's always a great joy when we can come together to worship Almighty God. And so thank you so much for joining us today for worship, whether you are one of our worship leaders here in the building or whether you are in our parking lot and worshiping with us via the radio or here on Facebook Live. We are excited that we can gather together to worship our risen Savior, Jesus. And so thank you for being with us. As we begin our time of worship, uh, please join us in our affirmation of faith. Today we'll be saying our Apostles' Creed. And so please join with me. And so Christians, I ask you, uh, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, now we come to a time where we share a little bit about the life of the church. And so let me share with you that our relaunch team, and that is the team of church leaders from St. Paul that have been meeting and discussing uh, basically every two weeks for the last several months on when we can start back in-person worship. Uh, they met this past Thursday night and have set a tentative goal to be back for in-person worship beginning on February, beginning on August the 9th, August the 9th. And so here in a couple weeks, more details will be shared with you on the procedures that will be put in place uh, for your safety. But please continue to keep that relaunch team in your prayers and also be praying for our church. As we go to God in prayer for our church, let's also be praying for Coleman Lyles and continue to be praying for God's blessing and healing upon him. And then let's also bring to God any requests that you may have. And so if you do have a prayer request, please share that with us. Uh, you may send that to us by posting it on our Facebook page or sending an email to the church. And rest assured, uh, that request will be lifted up to God in prayer. But let's go to God in prayer. And so, Almighty God, we come to you. We come to you as the body of Christ, that no matter where we may be in our time of worship, your spirit will meet us there 
that your spirit will come into our homes, into our offices, into our lives, that you will renew us and empower us to be your people. And so hear our prayers. We pray for your blessing upon this church, that your blessing will rest upon St. Paul United Methodist Church. We pray that you will use us for your glory here in this community and around the world. We pray for the many needs of the congregation. Today we lift up to you Coleman and among many others that your grace and mercy will be upon them to grant them healing. We also pray for all those who mourn the loss of loved ones, whether recently or maybe even many years ago, that in their time of grief, they will find you, Lord Jesus, as the source of all comfort. We also pray for those who are struggling with decisions, whether to take this path or this path, whether to go in this direction or, or that. And so we pray for you to grant them your wisdom, your clear guidance, give them the courage to follow you. Hear our prayers and be honored and glorified. And so now we join together as the disciples as we pray our Lord's Prayer, as we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, let's now continue in our worship of God through our giving. It's where we're able to give back to God a portion of what he has given to us. It's where we're able to give God our tithes and our offerings to support all that God is doing in and through this local congregation. Uh, you're invited to give either by transfer, electronic transfer, or by texting your donation, or the church office will be open Monday afternoon from 1 to 3, and you're invited to drop by and drop off your donation. Uh, but as we continue in our worship, let's pray for God's blessing upon our gifts. And so, Almighty God, we thank you for all that you provide us in our lives. We know you are the great provider, and so we offer you our tithes and our offerings, and we pray for your blessing upon them. Use these gifts to further your kingdom. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And all the poor and powerless And all the lost and lonely And all the things 
Our main scripture text today comes from the New Testament book of Acts. Uh, throughout this sermon series, we are studying the book of Acts and choosing different stories from that. And today's reading comes from Acts chapter 3. And the story goes from Acts chapter 3 through uh, chapter 4. And so you're invited to read that on your own. But today, let me read to you Acts 3 verses 1 to 10. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John, then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now, as Christians, we believe this is the word of God for us, the people of God. And so thanks be to God. Well, today we are going to continue our sermon series uh, that we began a couple weeks ago. And it's looking at that this church uh, is to be a place for everyone. That we are, as the people of St. Paul, that we are to be a place for everyone, that no matter who you may be, no matter where you are from, that you are welcome here. In fact, we began the series by talking about that we are to be a place where people can belong, where they can develop friendships and share life, where they can truly enter in no matter what type of job they may have, no matter what language they may speak, no matter what color their skin may be, no matter whether they have hair or are bald, no matter what it may be, that this is a place where they can belong and develop friendships and share life. And then last week we looked about, looked at how this is to be a place where people can come to know God. In fact, that's our first priority as a church, that we are to be a place to know God, where each of us individually will grow in our faith and grow in our understanding of who God is and how dearly and wonderfully he loves us. Well, today we're going to continue on in the series by looking at a place to find hope. And then next week, we'll talk about a place to learn. But today, I want us to talk about how we are called to be a place to find hope. And, and we need hope, don't we? We need hope for our lives, especially during this time of the pandemic. It, it's been going on now for many, many months. In fact, some will take it all the way back to February. Many will take it back to the month of March when schools shut, businesses began to close, 
and life was radically changed. Uh, I know for many of you, just within the last couple of weeks, uh, these masks that you may have been wearing for off and on for the last few months have now become a, a mandatory requirement that no matter whenever you leave your house, you're putting on a mask. It's this issue that the pandemic has changed life. It's deeply affected our lives, and it can seem, when is this going to end? Is, is there any hope? Will it ever end? Is it going to get better by September, or, or now is it going to get better by January, or is it going to get better in a year or two or three? It can lead us to where we feel hopeless. And then if you've watched the news in the last several months, you're deeply aware of the strife and the turmoil and all the, the problems and the pain that our society has. You, you can just look in the news in this past week about what's going on in the Portland area or in the Minneapolis area of our country and in different regions and how there's great conflict and pain. And people are angry, and that anger is boiling over, and it's causing more problems. And in the midst of that, it's, where is our hope? Where do we find hope for our lives? Or you can think just in your own local community, in, in this community of Circe, or, or let's take it even uh, more close, in your own home, in your own family, whether that's your immediate family, whether that's your spouse or, or your children or, or that extended family, how is this time impacting you? Have you, have you lost your job? Is your, has your income gone down? Are you no longer able to visit your aged parents? Are, are you no longer able to visit your grandchildren? Where is their hope? Now, so often as Christians, we say, well, our hope is in Christ. And that's firmly what we believe, that our hope is in Christ. But sometimes what that means is we pray and we ask God to intervene. We ask God to act on our behalf. But if we're really honest, we don't expect very much. We, we pray that God will intervene. But when we pray that, we don't really expect God to answer that prayer. <laughs> or we expect God to maybe, maybe grant us some peace, maybe grant us some grace, but we don't expect God to all of a sudden provide a vaccine. We, we don't expect God to provide us with a new job, and so we expect very little. But what I want to share with you today is that God wants to transform our lives into something that is truly beautiful. That God wants to transform our lives into something beautiful. And it's beyond all of our expectations. And that's really the gift for us as United Methodists. We come out of what's called the Wesleyan stream of theology. It goes back to this man in the 1700s called John Wesley and his brothers, Charles Wesley. And, and they formed this small group that came out of the Anglican church. And part of that theological emphasis that is truly a blessing for all of Christianity is their understanding of sanctification. It's that understanding of holiness. It's that understanding of righteousness that God's desire for us, for you, for me, is to transform our lives, to take us simply as we are, but to transform our lives in the God's image so that every part of our lives will be made holy and righteous, that every part of our lives well, they'll be made beautiful. Let me just share a few scriptures with you that illustrate this point. Uh, one is from 2 Corinthians 5.21. It's probably one of my favorite scriptures. It says, God made him who had no sin, talking about Jesus Christ, his only son, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. It's talking about how Jesus willingly came and he took all of our sin 
and he gave us all of his righteousness so that truly we are righteous in Jesus Christ. Or you can look at Ephesians 1, 4, where he said, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. I mean, just take that personally, that God chose you from before the creation of the world, that God chose you to be holy and blameless in God's sight. Or 2 Timothy 1.9, where it says, He saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. That we are called to live a life that is holy, to live a life that is pure and righteous, to live a life that is pleasing, not just to your mom, not just to your grandmother, but that we are called to live a life, well, that's beautiful and pleasing to God. Or you can look at Romans 3.22, and where it says, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. It's not that we have to continue to work and, and if we are good enough and, and we do all this long checklist of things, then finally we'll be made holy. But it's truly a gift from God. It's a gift from God of what God wants to do in your life. Now, one of my favorite authors is this uh, older English man named C.S. Lewis. And one of his classic books, one of my favorite books, is his book, Mere Christianity. Uh, he gives us a wonderful illustration about this. And so let me read it to you. I'll post the longer quote on Facebook later on. But here's what C.S. Lewis writes. He says, I think that many of us, when Christ has enabled us to overcome one or two sins that were an obvious nuisance, well, we are inclined to feel, though we may not put it in the words, that we are now good enough. He has done all we wanted him to do, and we should be obliged if he would now leave us alone. As we say, I never expected to be a saint. I only wanted to be a decent, ordinary chap. And we imagine when we say this that we are being humble. But this is a fatal mistake. Of course, we never wanted and never asked to be made into the sort of creatures he is going to make us into. But the question is not what we intended ourselves to be, but what he intended us to be when he made us. For he is the inventor we are only the machine. He is the painter. We are only the pitcher. How should we know what he means us to be like? We may be content to remain what we call ordinary people, but he is determined to carry out a quite different plan. To shrink back from that plan is not humility, it's laziness or cowardice, to submit to it is not conceit or megalomania. It is obedience. It's this call for us to put our trust and our faith in Christ. It's, it's that call for us to focus our attention to focus our gaze on Jesus. It's that call, that obedience, to put our faith and our trust, to submit our lives in the Jesus hand and allow him to transform us from the inside out, to transform every part of who we are into something that's beautiful, into something that's lovely, into something that is honoring and glorifying to God. Now, the Apostle Paul phrases it differently in Galatians 5 when he talks about the fruit of the Spirit. He says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, 
forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And that's what God wants to do, that when we submit our lives into his hands, well, he begins to transform our hearts. He begins to transform our desires. He begins to transform every part of us to breathe into us hope. Now, in our story from Acts, well, that's what we see. Just, just think about that story. And if you have your Bibles, you can turn again to that passage from Acts chapter 3. But basically, Peter and John, they are going to the temple. They're going at that ordinary time to pray and to worship God. They're going at that time of the evening sacrifice when the crowds are gathering to pray. And as they go, they enter in near that uh, archway known as the beautiful entrance. And as they see there, there was someone who was lame, someone who had been lame and crippled from birth. <clears throat> and the crippled man, he's begging, he's asking people for help. And he sees Peter and John walk by and he calls out to them. Except this time, Peter and John, they stop and they look at him and he, and they say, look at us. And so the beggar turns and, it, and he focuses attention on him. Now he's, he's expecting them to give him something. He's expecting maybe a few coins. He's expecting a little bit of money that will help him survive for the day. Or maybe they're even going to be generous. And he's expecting that maybe they'll be generous and he'll be able to eat for the week. And yet he's expecting so little. And Peter and John well, they overwhelm him. They overwhelm him with love and with grace. And they say, in the name of Jesus, you are healed. And then Peter grabs his hand and he raises him up. And as he raises him up, his body is healed. And he rejoices in celebration and in praise. That's what God wants to do for your life. Do you need hope in your life? God wants to take you wherever you may be, whether it's in a place where you feel completely hopeless, whether you are completely alone, whether you are completely overwhelmed with the stress of life, God wants to take you as you are and breathe into you hope. He wants to take your hand and lift you up to give you hope and to give you life. Now, I know God can do that. I've seen it countless times, not only in my own life, but in many lives. Let me just tell you a quick story about Teresa. Uh, Teresa's not a real name, but she was one in a previous congregation. And she had put her faith in Christ and, and had received that forgiveness of her sins. And, and with that came some joy. But really, she stopped there. She stopped looking to Jesus and, and really didn't want to go any further in her walk with Christ. Because she wanted to focus just on the salvation throughout eternity that God brought. But Teresa was, well, she was a hard woman. She was a an angry woman. She was very successful in her business. She was a, a very uh, important business leader, but her employees feared her. Her employees did not want her to come in near their cubicles because she was very hard. And if they didn't follow what she said, then she definitely let them know in every word that she knew, and many of them were not nice. And if you ever crossed her, if you ever did something that she didn't want, then she would seek revenge at all costs. Well, she reached a point where some personal struggles had really broken her heart and some personal pain had really deflated her ego. And at that point, God brought us together and, and I was able to share this message of hope. That God wanted more than just to forgive her sins and grant her heaven, but that God wanted to give her hope in the here and now. And that as she gave her life over to Jesus, and as she submitted her life to Christ, 
then God would transform her heart. But it would require her to focus on Jesus. It would require her to submit her life, her work, her everything to Jesus. Now, very fortunately, and and it's all what God has done, she willingly did that. She submitted her life to Christ. And and I was amazed that in the last two or three years, God transformed her heart so that she was no longer full of anger and full of bitterness, but that God softened her heart. And amazing things was because of this, she, she wasn't one to share her faith openly, but because of this, her co-workers knew there was something different. Her co-workers knew that something had changed in her life and began to ask her, what's going on? And because of that, she was able to share Christ with her office. It's that hope that God can bring to transform lives. Do you need hope in your life? God longs to transform you and is waiting for you to submit your life to him. We are called to be a place where people can find hope that no matter what's going on in their life, no matter how terrible or how wonderful it may be, that we are called to be a place, well, it's a place for everyone, where we can gather together to offer hope in Christ. Do you want to be a part of that? You're invited to come and to join us. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for the hope that you have for us. That you long to take us as we are and transform us, recreate us, to make us into something that's beautiful, that's holy, that's righteous, well, to make us into your image. I pray for for everyone here, but especially everyone that's watching, that your spirit will work in their hearts to hear you calling them. Help them to focus their eyes on you. Help them to to take your hand, to submit their lives to you, Lord Jesus. And then, Spirit of God, work in their hearts and do all that you want. May your will be done. Be glorified in us. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Working in 
Thank you again for joining us for this time of worship. We're so glad that we were able to gather together. Uh, we do hope that we'll be able to begin in-person worship beginning on August the 9th. Uh, more details will be sent out this week about that. Uh, but thanks again and receive now this benediction and this blessing as we finish our time of worship. And so may God pour his Holy Spirit down upon you. May God bless you. May God keep you. May he send you out to be a person of peace to his world. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.